All right, well, welcome to the second lesson in our series of lessons on shock. In this lesson, we are going to talk about the different stages of shock, as well as a brief overview of the different types of shock. My name is Eddie Watson, and I will be presenting this series of lessons for you. And in order to stay up to date on our lessons as we release them, make sure and subscribe to our channel below. Also, don't forget to hit the bell icon to be notified of any new lessons as soon as they become available. All right, in the last lesson, we gave a, a good overview of what exactly shock is, how our body responds to a shock state, uh, as well as some of the signs that you would expect to see in a patient that was in shock. But for this lesson, we're going to talk about the different stages of shock. So depending where you look and what you see, you may see a slightly different variation of this. But for the purpose of this lesson, when we talk about the stages of shock, we can really break down shock into three stages. We have stage one, stage two, and stage three. So sometimes you will hear people refer to something that they call the initial stage. And essentially what is happening here is the body is switching from aerobic respiration to anaerobic. And that's essentially all this initial stage is. So when we look at the first stage of shock, this is often called the compensated, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the non-progressive stage of shock. And what's important to know in this first stage of shock is that there is no drop in blood pressure yet. And what this tells us is that the body's compensation mechanisms have kicked in. And this is where we get the name compensated or the non-progressive because the blood pressure is not progressing, the patient is not progressing through the stages of shock yet. And so as we talked about in the last lesson with the body's physiological response to shock, if you think of that sympathetic response that we're going to get, we're going to see an increase in our heart rate as well as peripheral vasoconstriction. And with these, think about you're going to see an increase in heart rate. You're going to see pallor in your patient. You're also going to be able to feel their pulse because their blood pressure has not dropped. But you're also going to be able to feel that cool, clammy skin that's beginning to develop. Also in this stage, you're going to have the endocrine system that's beginning to release its hormones. And this is going to be in the release of renin and the antidiuretic hormone, which we talked about in the previous lesson. Now in this stage, despite the lack of blood pressure, you still should be able to recognize that your patient is in shock. And really when your patient is in this stage, this is when it's the ideal time for you to recognize that they are in shock. This is where you want to recognize that those compensatory mechanisms are working and work to treat that underlying cause. Okay, and so moving on to the second stage of shock, and this is what we refer to as either the decompensated or the progressive stages of shock. So at this point, the body's compensation mechanisms have been working, but they can only work for so long in that persistent state of whatever the cause of the shock is. And so now what you're going to be able to see is that drop in blood pressure. And as time goes on, you're going to see that blood pressure progressively get lower and lower and lower. Hence, this is where the name progressive shock comes from or decompensated because the body is no longer compensating. And as a result, overall, your patient's condition is going to be deteriorating. And in this second stage, this is when you're going to see the hypoxic injury. And this is going to come as a direct result of the decreased perfusion and the decreased oxygen supply. And as this shock continues on and you continue to have more and more injury 
more and more damage done to the cells and organs as a result of that persistent hypotension. You'll begin to see the effects of this on all the major body systems. So you'll have the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the gut, the liver, the lungs, and even our blood vessels. And in the brain, this is going to be a result of that decreased cerebral perfusion pressure. And this is where you're going to get the confusion, lethargy, altered mental status. In the heart, this is going to be a result of the muscle cell death. And this is going to lead to things like acute MI and dysrhythmias. In the kidneys, you're going to end up with acute tubular necrosis, which is going to lead to a renal failure. In the gut, you're going to have decreased or absent peristalsis. And this can lead to an ileus, ulcers, and even GI bleeding. And in the liver, what happens is a term that we often call shock liver. But essentially, this is an acute hepatic failure. Now in the lungs, there's a couple different things going on. So in addition to the direct damage of the hypoperfusion to the lung tissue, one of the results of this cascading process is that you'll end up seeing an increased capillary permeability. And essentially what this means is that the spaces between cells and the capillaries open up and it allows fluid to shift from the intravascular space into the cells and the third space. And when this happens in the lungs and the fluid builds up inside the alveoli, you're no longer able to oxygenate and it continues to cause damage to the lungs and the lung tissue. And then this is where your patients can go into acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. And this ultimately will lead to respiratory failure. And finally, damage inside the blood vessels can lead to disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. And essentially, this is full-scale clotting throughout the entire body, microclots in, in all areas of the body, which can do damage, one, by blocking off or decreasing perfusion even more within the capillary beds, and can lead to the state where your body has used up all of its clotting factors. And given that our liver is also not working as well, we're not going to have a healthy replenishment of those clotting factors as well. And so as you can see, the body is slowly beginning to fall apart. The different organ systems are slowly beginning to fail. And so it is imperative that we intervene at this point. If we're able to intervene at this stage and prevent the patient from deteriorating to the next stage, it is possible that the patients can still make a full recovery. So again, I'm going to highlight this because this is so very important to know. All right, so if we move on to our third and final stage of shock, this stage is called the irreversible or also called the refractory stage of shock. In this stage, unfortunately, your patient is going to have irreversible physiological changes. And ultimately at this stage, your patients are going to have multiple organ distress syndrome, MODS as we call it, or essentially multi-organ failure. All of this is a result of that persistent state of hypoperfusion and as a result of the progressive shock that just continued to progress without fixing the underlying cause. An important thing to know about this stage, the irreversible stage of shock, and one important thing to know about this stage of shock, the irreversible stage, is there's really no way you're unable to tell when your patient actually goes into this stage. There's no telltale sign that says that you have crossed from stage two to stage three. But unfortunately, what this means is while your patient is currently still alive, they will ultimately die. And one thing that you will notice in this stage is oftentimes 
the body still can respond to interventions and things that we're doing. So oftentimes you'll still be able to increase the patient's blood pressure, but again, it's not going to have an effect on the end result. And so again, I can't stress this enough. It's still important to continue to do your interventions and do what we can to try and support the patient and to improve their state of shock. Because again, you won't be able to tell when your patient crosses into this irreversible stage. And therefore, you should just continue to treat as you would. And so again, the big takeaway for this stage of shock is to really treat before you get to this point. Resolve the underlying cause of the shock and prevent your patient from reaching this irreversible stage. All right, so now that we have covered the different stages of shock, hopefully you have an understanding of what's happening in each of these stages, as well as the importance of really being able to fix that underlying cause of shock. We're now going to move on to talk about the different types of shock. Now, essentially, these types of shock are going to be our causes. And essentially, there's three main categories of shock, and a couple of them have a few subcategories as well. This is just going to be a quick overview of these categories of these types of shock, as we are going to do a deep dive into each of these later on in future lessons as a part of this series. All right, so the first category for the types of shock is going to be what we call hypovolemic. And essentially, hypovolemic is really a lack of blood volume. And for this category, this is the only type of shock that there is. And so the next category or type of shock that we're going to talk about is cardiogenic. And there is one subcategory to cardiogenic shock, and this is what we call obstructive shock. Now, while the underlying pathophysiology between cardiogenic and obstructive shock are quite different, ultimately the result is the same, and that is in pump failure. Essentially, the heart is unable to meet the demands of the body. Now for our third and final category or type of shock, we're going to have what is called distributive shock. And within distributive, there are three subcategories of shock. The first of these is going to be neurogenic. The next of these is going to be anaphylactic. And the third and final and Probably the most common one that most people will see is going to be septic shock. Now again, the underlying pathophysiology between these three subcategories of distributive shock are quite different. The end result of what is causing the shock is essentially the same process, which is all due to an increased vascular volume. And by increased vascular volume, what I'm referring to is the volume of space that the vasculature takes up, not the actual volume that's in there. And so you have this massive increase in the volume that the blood needs to fill, which then leads to a distribution problem of the blood that is currently in the system. As I said, this is a quick overview of these different types of shock that we have here. We are going to be doing a deep dive lesson into just about every single one of these in future lessons in this series. So make sure and keep an eye out for those. And that said, this is going to conclude this lesson in our series on shock. In this lesson, we talked about the different stages of shock, as well as a quick overview of the types or causes of shock. As always, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you found this lesson to be informative for you. Uh, if you like this video and you did find it useful, make sure and hit that like button as it really helps get the word out about our channel. And in the comments below, let us know your favorite part of this video, uh, as well as ask any questions that you might have out there. Finally, make sure and check out the next lesson on this series.
as we begin our deep dive into the types of shock and begin talking about hypovolemic shock. Or you can also check out another one of our great series of lessons that we have on hemodynamics. Thank you, and you guys have a great day.